raising the establishment agreement this year. Next, please. So we are governed by, at the highest level, we are governed by uh, uh, so the so-called governing board composed of the uh, environment uh, senior uh, uh, officials and the ASEAN uh, Secretariat, Secretary General of ASEAN. Uh, on the technical side, we are uh, uh, being provided uh, guidance by the working group on nature conservation and we have contact points in every country. Next, please. And with respect to funding support, from 2005 to 2010, we were, ACP was fully funded by the European Union. But in 2010, uh, starting 2011, uh, EU said that uh, it has new priorities and therefore funding has stopped. But the ASEAN member state decided we will not be hampered by all of these. We will proceed and uh, make life uh, for ACP. That's why in 2011 up to the present, operational fund is being uh, given by the Philippine government. And the ASEAN member states are also providing in-class and in contribution. Uh, our project funds are coming from donors and partners. And uh, so that we will make sure that the ACD and ASEAN members need to be protected forever, we're trying to, uh, to uh, put up this ASEAN biodiversity trust fund, it's about $1 million. We are hoping that we can reach uh, 100 million US dollars very soon so that it can be sustainable. You don't have to donate much, just much. Uh, we're not coming in yet we're, uh, because we know, we know that you will donate voluntarily. But that's one of the trust of our uh, center. Next, please. We have this uh, program areas, biodiversity information management, species conservation, wildlife law enforcement, economics and ecosystems of biodiversity, public awareness, ecotourism, business and biodiversity, climate change and biodiversity, access and benefit sharing, taxonomy and basic alien species. So it cut across many of the uh, subjects in natural resources and environment. Next, please. So we have this on the ground. We have ASEAN heritage parks, coastal and marine biodiversity, transboundary protected areas, uh, urban biodiversity, agro-biodiversity, and wetlands and peatlands. Next, please. These are our flagship programs, ASEAN heritage parks, as I said. We implement projects on the ground. Then we have this clearing house mechanism, whereby uh, the countries exchange information on uh, the status of their biodiversity. And uh, likewise, every five years, we come up with this ASEAN Biodiversity Outlook. This year uh, is Biodiversity Outlook number two, as I uh, will uh, mention later. Next, please. So, ASEAN Heritage Parks. These are protected areas of high conservation importance, preserving in total a complete spectrum of representativeness and potential of the ASEAN region. Okay, so these are the best of the best uh, protected areas in Southeast Asia. Next, uh, as of the moment, we have 38 Asian Heritage Parks, 29 terrestrial, 4 marine, and 5 wetland. Next, please. Eight of these Asian Heritage Parks are found in the Philippines. Next, please. For the Philippines, we have Mount Apo, here located in, uh, in uh, uh, Davao. Mount Humiditan, also in Mindanao. Mount Inglit Baco. Uh, Mount Itanglan, also in Mindanao. Mount Makiling, which is Los Banos. Mount Malinda, still in Mindanao. Mount Pipo, Hibok Hibok, still in Mindanao. And Tubata in Palawan. So, Mindanao has so many uh, Asian heritage parks. Next, please. Next. Uh, the other flagship programs, the clearing house mechanism, uh, mechanism, as I have said, if you want to know, uh, how your country is doing with respect to threatened and endangered species. That is uh, the clearing house mechanism that uh, we're having. Next, please. We have this National Biodiversity Outlook. Uh, it's a thick uh, publication. It was launched uh, this year. And you can take a look at how this country is faring with respect to biodiversity conservation and management. Next, please. Our current portfolio, as I've said, our funding is coming from the Philippines and the ASEAN member states. But on a project level, we have the ASEAN EU, we have ASEAN India, we have ASEAN Japan, we have China, under ASEAN China and MINEP China, we have Germany, we have also the Philippines uh, uh, requesting our assistance uh, in, uh, in some of their projects. 
and the Republic of Korea. Next, please. So we have a network of partners now numbering to about 400 local, international. Next, please. Uh, these are uh, the significant uh, events for 2017 with respect to the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity. One is, uh, next please. Yeah, it's uh, ASEAN EU Biodiversity Conservation and Management of Protected Areas in ASEAN Project. This is very, very important and significant for us because, as mentioned earlier, in 2011, you said we are changing priorities, we are changing course, we are no longer dealing with biodiversity. But you know, now they're coming back to us. We are helping you again. It's 10 million euro uh, helping uh, helping the uh, helping the uh, ASEAN member states. Next, please. So we have uh, the AKO2 launch uh, just in July. Uh, next, please. We have uh, now, uh, we are now pursuing one dollar for Asian biodiversity. If there are 630 million people in Asia, we are able to get 10% of them to make one dollar. We will have about 63 million dollars. But I'm sure all of you here will donate one dollar. You can donate maybe one half dollar. <laughs> or you can have your name inscribed in our uh, wall uh, forever. Uh, it's, not, it's not this small room. Uh, I'm sure you don't have much cash now, but. Uh, We'll have the proper time, but we'd rather ask you to help us. Next, please. We have uh, uh, a new headquarters donated by the Philippine government to the ASEAN, and uh, ASEAN is very happy. You are welcome to please visit us in Laguna. That's uh, Secretary Simato, KFD Bongtel, and uh, all the other uh, member states last July in celebration of 50th year. Next, please. ASEAN by University Heroes. The 10 uh, countries have their respective heroes now. Next, please. Next. Our dream, our dream, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is to really showcase ASEAN as a model to the world for biodiversity conservation and management. Just like in our story, if we help, if we join hands, then we'll be able to have a happy ASEAN region. And uh, at the forefront of the SSC would like ASEAN Biodiversity to be at the forefront of ASEAN 2025. Next, please. So ASEAN is very committed to ASEAN uh, Biodiversity Conservation. We urge you to be our co-champions. And with that, yes, please, next, please. Just in time for my 15 minutes, I thank you. You can visit us on our website. Thank you very much. Outstanding young scientist given by the Philippines uh, in, of the Philippines, conferred by the National Academy of Science and Technology. He is the Philippine representative to the European Union Asia Expert uh, Panel for Climate Diplomacy, the chair of the ASEAN Science Diplomats, and the U.S. ASEAN Fellow for Science and Technology supported by the U.S. Department of State and USAID Regional Development Mission for Asia and ASEAN. 
Professor Manat Watts studied climate change and energy at Harvard Kennedy School, Harvard University, and took a sustainability leadership program from Yale University. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Banalitz. <laughs> well, I'm only given 10 minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Hi. And some of you are very sleepy. Anyway, I'm going to proceed with my presentation. Next slide, please. All right, the ultimate of the presentation, I'm not just a discussant, because when I receive the invitation, it's not just about being a discussant, but of course, it's a speaker in this particular conference. So the outline is based in Bible two. It's about the food, energy, water, and energy system. It's a CADR solution for the food, energy, water, and energy interaction in the Philippines. And definitely the other one is about the people's survival fund, which is very beneficial and very important in the Philippines. Next slide. Right, if we just go back to the, uh, the UN IPCC, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the United Nations uh, International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, we are considering this as a function of hazard, exposure, and vulnerability. Now, next slide. Now, remember, in 2013, when Super Tycoon Haiyan, Rilanta, made its landfall, remember, we scientists were able to predict how strong Super Tycoon Haiyan, Rilanta was. We scientists were able to predict how vulnerable the people would be affected. We also we were, we were all able to predict how strong the land was. Remember, it was 240 kilometers per hour. But what we failed to provide to the people is the interruption of this food, energy, water when the disaster, uh, when this disaster made its landfall. Remember, there was food insecurity. It took two to three months before electricity came in, and there was looting that happened in that particular area. So in this particular example, if we look at the hazard, exposure, and vulnerability, here I'm sure you know what hazards are. The hazards are the events that we encounter every year. All right. In this particular case, the best, the best example is tropical cyclones. If we look at the map, all right, the red and the color, it means that the more tropical cyclones are concentrated in that particular area. And in that map, Luzon, Palo Verde, Isaias, and then of course Mindanao. In terms of exposure. Here we use population as the exposure. Now, uh, the bluer the color, the bluer the color, the more populated the areas are. And in terms of vulnerability, we use we use the HDI and the human development index we're in. We consider age, education, and income. So what do we mean by that? In HDI, we talk about age. Who are again more who are more vulnerable to different types of hazards? The people who are young or the people who are who are who are who are old. In terms of education, who are again more vulnerable to different types of hazards? The people who have education or the people who don't have any education at all? In terms of income, who are again more vulnerable? The people who are rich or the people who are poor? Next slide. Just to provide you a very simple analysis, all right? This, if this happened in Municipal Tokogu Sabika Marina Sur, that remember the 5% calamity ban under Section 324-T, all right, of that particular law. Now, 5% goes to the lamp demand. If you have, if you have 10 million, if you get 5% of that, we have 500,000 pesos that is, that is allotted to your calamity demand. Now, if we look at a very simple analysis, if the total population, 19,653, is affected by one particular tropical cyclone or hazard, do you know the volume of the local government units? Look at the chart. Look at the chart. It's just 26 pesos. If one particular tropical cycle enters smart, it stays there for a day. Now, if we talk about the risk assessment, we are talking about the worst case scenario that might happen in an area. If that particular tropical cycle stays there for five days, do you know that the budget of the LTE of the local government units? It is just five pesos per individual. Now, if 20% of the population is 3,930, got affected, all right, it's affected by this particular tropical cyclone, the budget of the local government unit is 120 pesos. And if that particular tropical cyclone stays there for five days, the budget is 26 pesos. So what is our conclusion? The conclusion is that the budget that's allotted, the 5% allotted fund, is not enough. It's considered to be the resource, that's why 
we, Filipinas, are very much dependent on the donations and grants that are being delivered, being given by the different international agencies and by the national government and these institutions. Next slide. Am I speaking too fast? Sorry, because I'm only given 10 minutes, so I have this big, uh, all right. Hope you understand like, what I am giving. Next slide, please. All right, so what is the solution? What is an option? We are developing the system, the Port Energy Water Next System. All right, next slide. And what is the purpose of this particular system? It's actually for the entire Philippines. And once this particular system is developed, it is going to be adopted by some of the ASEAN member states. By um, being a member or being one of the ASEAN US fellows for science and technology, this is also going to be adopted by the other scientists, top scientists in Southeast Asia. So, and, all right, in the Philippines, we are, uh, we already started with this particular system. So it's not just a creation of innovative and comprehensive side of system about the food and the water. It's not just about the database of your resources, the uh, resources, uh, food and the water resources. Why? Why are we doing this? Remember, in one province, one particular municipality is affected by a certain hazard. Where are you going to get the resources? If you have a database of all these resources in your province, municipality A, municipality B, municipality C, if a certain hazard happens, you know where you're going to get the resources. Next slide. All right, it's also going to provide an understanding about this particular food energy water density system. And the beauty of this particular system, it is not just, it cannot only be used, utilized by our scientists. It can also be transformed, it can also be utilized, can be used by our by ordinary people. This, it, they can also access this particular system. Next slide. So we're also going to provide trainings to all these stakeholders in the Philippines. And here in the Philippines, we started in Mindanao. We started in South Surgeon region, uh, getting some information and developing that particular system in the area of South Surgeon. I'm going to show you some of the pictures later. Next slide. Next, next slide, sorry. The system covers 82 provinces, 135 cities, 1,493 municipalities and 42,020 barangays in the Philippines. Next slide. Next slide. Next. And that is the framework. Now, like what I said, for instance, in this particular jacket, this is one of the outputs. All right. If, for instance, you have, you have uh, there's a disaster and affects your water resources, if you look at the chart, uh, what happens? Remember, there's a problem in your water security and where are you going to get the resources? You can get the resources either from municipality A or from municipality B. That's one of the best examples. Next. Next slide. Next. Next slide. So aside from the system, all right, because we're planning to put out also hubs, all right, in different regions, one in, uh, one in every province in the Philippines. Next. So these are the areas, just to give you some, just, just to provide you some milestones, because what somebody asked about the role of the, of the millennials. Actually, my researchers are all undergraduates. They are 16 years old, 16 to 19 years old, and they're doing this kind of research. We are not just limited on, uh, on climate modeling. In order to validate our results, we go to different areas. We go to, to, to the most vulnerable areas in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So these are uh, some of our milestones. Uh, in order, all right, to achieve the goal of the Climate Smart Philippines, we partnered with different agencies in the Philippines. In Mindanao, we call it the Climate Smart Mindanao, and our partner in Mindanao uh, is Mindanao Development Authority. In the Visayas, of course, you know, Father Quevedo, uh, Father Quevedo is Archbishop Quevedo. Our Archbishop Quevedo is also our partner, the Mindanao River Basin Council President. Now for for the Visayas, our partner is Authority of the Cruise, uh, the DAP. DAP is also our partner for the uh, for the Climate Smart Visayas. For Luzon, our partner is the PCSD Palawan Council for Sustainable Development. In some areas of Luzon, one of our partners is also the Harvard Kennedy School Alumni Association of the Philippines. Next. So these are some of our areas. The terms of reference, the promotion, the promotion, implementation, and the monitoring of the food energy water energy system. And number two, and the most important, and which is considered to be the hot topic in the country, is the, the People's Survival Fund. Sorry, yes. Next slide. 
So these um, we have some partners, development partners like USAID, ADB, China, all right? And then they also provide trainings to different national government agencies and regional agencies in the country, CSOs, uh, NGOs, and the private sector industries, and even HPIs. Next. So these are some of our partners. This is Davao City. Some of them are many, uh, there are many searchers. Next, next slide. We went to Sarangani Province. Next. Sultan Kitara Province. Next. South Kutabando. Takurong City. General Santos. And even Tabel de Oro. All right. For, for the People's Survival Fund, actually our partner is with the Development Authority and we already started, next slide, we already started to roll this out. We did trainings to local government units on how this People's Survival Fund can be accessed by our local government units and by our local community organizations. For Batch 1, please continue, for Batch 1, 11 LGUs were trained, or 11 LGUs were trained, all right, in, uh, in collaboration with the Development Authority. In batch two, all right, batch two, 13 local government units. Now, if you ask me who can access this fund, I'm going to say it can be accessed by local government units and can also be accessed by our local community organizations. How much is the fund? It's one billion grand and there's no ceiling. Now, if you ask me what is the role of every sector whenever we conduct this training, I saw that some of you came from the, from the universities, uh, from the colleges, from the academy. The, the role of the academy is very much important simply because that when we did our rollout, we found out that there is a lack of capacity for these local government units to come up with a climate science-based proposal. Simply because the People's Survival Fund can only be accessed if your proposal is considered to be a climate science-based. That it has to contain climate science, it has to contain climate scenarios, it has to contain climate projections. If that proposal is not contained, uh, the things that I said, this will just be given back to the LTU for enhancement. And that is the role of the HTIs, SUCs, private and public, to help all these LGUs, LGUs that are near to your place to develop that particular proposal. All right? So again, it's only applicable, PSF is only one, can only find climate change adaptation projects and not climate change mitigation. All right? Based on the law, based on the RA 10174, it can only finance climate change adaptation and not climate change mitigation projects. Next slide. Sorry. These, these are just some of the projects that can be funded by the People's Survival Fund. Next. Now, out of 100 uh, submissions, do you know how many people or how many LGs got accepted or approved? Out of hundreds, there are only four. Two last year, and two weeks ago there were only two. There were uh, additional two. Two, one from Shergao, the other one is the Nusa Rigal, the Nusa Sarugal de Nusor. That's from Bridge to Rain Project, all right? And then, two weeks ago, uh, one was also approved. Uh, two were approved, one in Corona, and the other one is in the Montes Island. So, simply because a lot of people are asking, a lot of elders are asking, even the universities, and a lot of people are asking, why is it so hard to get this particular fund? The answer is because it's a grant. Simply because it is not a business as usual project, it is a climate science, uh, climate change adaptation project. And it has to contain climate science. So, pictures. All right, so in Mindanao, because Mindanao Development Authority is here, we are partnered. So, 30 seconds, sorry. All right, these are the members. This particular Mindanao Development Corridor, corridor was created in order to help the people of Mindanao, of Mindanao to access the fund. So um, they, created, they, uh, they created this particular MITCC JPT for PSF. <coughs> uh, we have, it, it is composed of Minda, DILG, CHED, NEDA, US Teacher, ECRI, our research center, and of course the Global Green Road Institute, our development partner. Next slide. So like what I said, it, the capacity development, the capacity building that we gave is not just an ordinary capacity building because it contains science. We taught the local government units how to do climate modeling. We taught them how to do the risk and we taught them how to do some climate scenarios and projections. For batch one, 
next for batch two so these are the local government units all right thank you thank you very much Thank you, Glenn. Uh, sorry if we have to uh, shorten yeah. your time, but we can, we can, you can have more time uh, if there are questions from the floor. Any um, clarification, comments, questions on the two presentations and uh, discussion by Professor. Yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Professor Darwin J. Mandubab of the Mindanao State University, Iligan Institute of Technology. The question has something to do with disaster risk governance, and uh, I think uh, OCD discussed about uh, the framework, etc. But um, uh, my research uh, has something to do with risk governance, and one of the major issues especially so at the local level, is really a problem of governance. A number of uh, these include, say, for example, politicized the office, uh, and this covers corruption, some inefficiency, issues of coordination and collaboration, uh, reactive the RRM, and uh, the LGU reputation in terms of managing disaster. I agree with the idea of really capacitating the LGUs, but uh, despite the effort, uh, based from the research, because I also did a number of uh, case studies from uh, areas in Luzon, Luzon, and Luzon. The problem really is the, the, the capacity of uh, local governments, because you know when there is an election, the DRM office personnel will then be replaced with new people because some of them are appointed by the mayor, and then if there's a new mayor, and the mayor is not really familiar with the RMM, then you have another training, etc., etc., et and even the utilization of the fund at the local level. So this is really problematic <clears throat> based from the findings. I mean, it boils down to uh, the governance as a principle, and even in, in some areas in Southeast Asia. So probably um, the question that I need to further uh, throw to the to the office, OCD or, or others, is in terms of capacity building. Uh, what is the extent of capacity to building of LGUs in this aspect? And probably some policy changes as to the management of the DRM office. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the thank you for the question. And we also see that, uh, that that's uh, I wouldn't say it's quite prevalent, but it's it exists. No? It, it happens, and it's very sad because. They're the front line, they're the responders. LGUs are always the front liners uh, regarding the RRM disaster management, disaster response. One way to do this is to continue uh, with capacity building. We recognize that, of course, when the local chief executive changes, of course, he will also change his DRRM. One thing we're doing is we're drafting a bill to amend uh, Republic Act 1121. We're going to strengthen the provisions of appointing a DRRM officer and adding to the qualifications of the DRRM officer. And looking into the possibility of, of even strengthening the office and requiring the local chief executive to appoint a permanent DRRM officer within six months of assuming his office, his or her office. Because one thing that's happening now is that the DRRM officer is just part-time in some municipalities and cities, meaning to say that the DRRM officer is sometimes also the building officer or is sometimes also the, I mean, sometimes the treasurer, something like that. No? So we want a more permanent DRRM focal system. That, that's what, that's one solution. And that may need an enhanced uh, provision in the, 
in terms of um, the performance, yung, yung performance related issues, this is where the whole of society approach comes in. Because it's supposed to be not just the government, not just the local government, or not even just the national government stepping in when needed. That's why this is where we, we come to the support of our CSOs and of our private sector organizations to help us out. Of course, it's still what the right is to the government, but there's no one agency that can manage disasters. And so it is really a whole of society effort. And we recognize that there's still gaps. And we looked at that when we did the sunset review of uh, RA 1121 beginning in 2014. And part of the uh, results of the gap analysis of RA 1121, we're inputting in the mandatory bill that we're finalizing. And this is also in line with the pronouncement of the president last uh, SONA that there should be a standalone or a separate department or agency that manages disasters. So that's what we're doing now, and that's where we're giving the words. No? And so as, as you'll see in the coming months, we'll be more uh, pronounced in our efforts. No? And it would be good to get uh, bits and pieces from your study, and perhaps if we could meet, and we could orient us on what you found based on uh, their grassroots interactions, so that we can also use this to refine our uh, proposed uh, measure. Any more questions, please? Good afternoon, Mr. Pekin. I'm Rodel from the Wally Community, uh, Intelligence Community, sir. Um, we have, I, I volunteer to my community to have indigenous knowledge studies on the climate change. Thus, the OCD could have give us funds or we validate those studies in adapting climate change for indigenous communities. Uh, thank you for that. Of course, we welcome all inputs no, and all interactions with our uh, both public sector and private sector uh, shareholders, stakeholders. Uh, OCD is only up to the regional level. No? So we can coordinate with you. We can give you, uh, we, we can, you can participate in the RD, RRMC, the Regional Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, because each region is specific in its needs. No? Iba yung needs sa Region 5, iba yung needs sa ARMM, iba yung needs sa CAR, for example. So what you could contribute, we will welcome that, and we can look into possible partnerships. Of course, pag may funds na kasama, of course, we, we would have to look into uh, what is allowable and what is not allowable. But of course, any interaction, any partnership, that would advance DRRM as a more effective um, initiative on the part of both the government and the private sector. That's very much welcome. So what we could do, we could link you up with, the, with our regional office, in uh, uh, our OCD regional office, and then we'll discuss how, how you can present what you have, your suggestion, and perhaps if it's good and if it's applicable with other regions to other regions here in Mindanao, we could replicate it. So we're very much open to that. And we will link, because linking up is the first step. No? It's the first step. Then we'll, we'll look at our commonalities, we'll look at our common visions, uh, what, what we want in the end. No? And again, just let us know how you want to assist and we will find a way for you to have a voice in the council and so that you'd help us also in our IDCs for our people in the ground. Okay, yes, please. <coughs> uh, good afternoon, I'm Robert Pertubay from USM, University of Staff in Indiana. I hear a lot about, uh, say, uh, ecosystem conservation and sustainability about greening program, this and that. And uh, how, sir, about the ecosystem uh, and uh, the, the ASEAN, uh, the Oriole Agency is keeping track 
as to sustainability issue about this and uh, in terms of projection as we move on years by years. Are we really advancing or retrogressing? Because uh, are you know about the, uh, a lot of this in our community, uh, planting this and that, and in the end, uh, uh, it's not turning out to be 100% uh, being sustained. And so it has something to do with uh, our direction for uh, preserving ecosystem and uh, attaining sustainability, which is important for uh, our asset. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, it's a very, very important uh, uh, observation. This week, or two days ago, I was with the group of the uh, Bong Tep and uh, we went to a place called uh, Doi Tu. You know, it's in Thailand. It's a 15,000 hectare forest land. In 1988, the land was ravaged by Kaingit, Okyu, and what have you. Thereafter, the royalty of uh, the, uh, the Royal Family of Thailand decided to adapt the project, started reforestation. And 30 years after now, we now have the coffee plantation, macadamia, uh, clay, and it's now all over. And that is the model that they are now showcasing for Thailand and for other countries now. And I was actually uh, very impressed, having seen the same thing in the Philippines. You know, the one good thing about what happened in Thailand is the consistency of the policy and direction. What I'm saying is that in 1988 up to today, the management plan has been followed to the letter. And I would like to say that unfortunately for our country, Philippines. There are other similar initiatives, but somehow when there is a change in administration, the priorities change. And that is why the NEDA was also there and so were other countries. But what I'm saying is that uh, there should really be a consistency in our approach towards sustainable development. Because personally, I have seen it in my own eyes. When you empower communities and local governments, and they are really empowered, meaning their lives change, their economic uh, uh, condition are enhanced, but somehow, government says it's no a priority. Now, we who are here should advocate for consistency in sustainable development. Otherwise, we might lose what we are fighting for. And that is why under the ASEAN Center for Biodiversity, what we would like to see for this ASEAN heritage parks, first, we would like them to have management plans. Second, these management plans should be managed by the different stakeholders and not just by the central government. Third, there must be alternative livelihood programs. Gone are the days when we are uh, concentrating on logs and timber. Now, ecotourism, uh, other alternative livelihoods. And the Philippines should take advantage of the Asian Center for Biodiversity being hosted by the Philippines. There are many best practices in Thailand, in Malaysia, uh, in Indonesia, where the countries can, uh, can actually experience, can actually learn. And we're also very fortunate that uh, all the member, uh, all the international community supporting ASEAN. And I think, uh, uh, 
we are very happy that the level of awareness of the Philippines actually is one of the highest in Southeast Asia with respect to biodiversity uh, conservation management, natural resources management. What is important is to see the way that people should actually be placed at the forefront of development. It is not you come up with policies and expect people to follow what we have seen in Doitung, and it's actually a truism. You take care of the people, and the people will take care of the environment, sustainable development. It's a long shot, but Doitung and all the others are showing that it can be done. Now, unfortunately, uh, as safety director uh, of uh, ACB, we uh, we've been negotiating with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, Germany to come up with uh, support funds for this Asian Heritage Park in the Philippines. Unfortunately, most of these Asian Heritage Park are in uh, Mindanao, and they would like to see the vision order condition improve first before uh, they bring in the technical and other uh, support here. But but really, I, I think. Uh, local government, just like in, uh, in climate change. It's really people in power, it's really local government. And uh, if you, the ASSC, I was listening yesterday and people going around, people empowerment, people empowerment. At the end of the day, make them responsible for their own, uh, for their own uh, uh, environment, for their ecosystem, and they will take care of the ecosystem. And the ecosystem will take care of them. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Yes, please. Good afternoon. I'm Mark Anthony Torres of Mindanao State University, Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, my question is addressed to Asik Purisima. We are concerned that after the Marawi siege, because Illinois is just about 30 to 45 minutes from Marawi, that the first to respond from our city is our Illinois city disaster risk management office. However, since uh, most of the training is conducted by these offices on natural hazards, earthquakes, fires, uh, storms, I we had this observation that they were in a stand, they were confused on how to respond to the massive displacement of people from Marawi to Elite City. Because I think the focus of the DRMO office is uh, natural hazard. Uh, when I also googled uh, this afternoon about um, disaster risk management, really mainly focused on natural hazards. I would like to ask our uh, asset if uh, for the disaster risk management, um, is there a plan to also include human induced disasters in the future aside from natural hazards? Yes, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, um, first, that is correct. No? It was the Elegant City DRRM uh, office that was one of the um, entities that first responded. No? What happened there was around the, the siege happened May 23, right? May 26, that was day four, we established, I was in Elegant, we established the Regional Command and Coordination Center uh, in Iligan. In Iligan. It was established by both OCD 10 and OCD Army. So we established that and it has functioned ever since. No? Day 4 until now, day 92, 93. So, and we're very thankful to the Iligan city government for accommodating. And that was really the, the issue was because initially, we didn't know where the IDPs were because culturally we understand that the Maranaos prefer to stay with relatives and friends as opposed to staying in evacuation centers. And day three, actually before we went to Iliga, I remember that that was flagged in one of our coordination meetings that we should be ready for the sudden influx because perhaps a few days, hindi pa lalabas yung mga IDPs from their relatives and friends. Pero baka after uh, five days, after one week, lalabas na. And nandun na sa mga IVAC centers. No? And I think right now, we're maintaining, if I'm not mistaken, 72, 75 evacuation centers still. 
Um, so that's the situation on the ground. It's being it's being addressed, and it's it has been handed over to Task Force Bang Marawi, of which I'm the spokesperson. So uh, we will keep you updated there also. And uh, then just to answer regarding human induced, no, we actually have three NDRPs, National Disaster Response Plans. One for hydromet, one for earthquakes, geological, and one for consequence management as a result of terrorism and other human induced um, activities. No? So we have those three. Um, I understand that mass, uh, that the NDRPs for geomet and uh, and uh, what they call this hydromet, uh, hydromet and, and, and geohazards, they're the ones that are more relatively cascaded, but we're also cascading the NDRP for consequence management for terrorism and other human use activities. So it's it's being done. Uh, and thank you for your comment that actually uh, gives us a trigger to to cascade it more than only the other effective. It doesn't appear to be that effective yet, at least optics wise, because people don't seem to feel it. And that's and that's uh, on us and we, we, we should make it more uh, felt on the ground. And we have another concern. Just an observation also, sir, because I think very important, when the Illegal City Disaster Risk Reduction Management Office um, <coughs> was responded, we saw a lot of cultural sensitivity in the interventions. So I think very important, even uh, trainings on cultural sensitivity, because most of our officers there are uh, Christians, uh, settlers, and uh, they didn't know how to respond to the displacement of animals from, from Marawi. They have different cultures. Uh, right now, we are conducting the post-conflict needs assessment, and we're beginning with the human aspect of the PCNA, and we're making sure we oriented at least 200 to 300 um, assessors, and this includes Maranao speaking assessors, so that we'll make sure that we can really reach out on the ground. So. We, we know that, and siguro initially, nagkakagulo pa, initially, um, there may have been some gaps there, but we made sure to correct them. And the National Oper Emergency Operations Center, is uh, the, the, the staff there are meeting every day, and the task force, task force of Marawi, we're, we're in touch also every day. In fact, every Friday, there's an executive committee meeting of the task force, and in fact, today, I understand there's a meeting of the focal persons for uh, financial uh, management to identify the priority needs as we move forward with the PCNA. And we're making sure that everything, even the things we purchase, that are uh, that they are sensitive to the culture and faith of our brothers and sisters in Marawi. So thank you again for that reminder, and we'll make sure that everything will be uh, culturally and uh, faith, uh, sensitive in terms of the culture and faith of our brothers and sisters. Thank you. Uh, there's one more, last of the last. <laughs> in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, we say the head of my Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm Dr. Mary Joyce Tinto, Sali of Mindanao State University, Marawi and Tawi. My question is directed to Assistant Secretary Borisima, and this is a rejoinder to the question of my fellow professors at MSU. Um, sir, aside from climate change, uh, environmental issues, the current emerging security issues, including terrorism and uh, um, violence in Mindanao, particularly due to happen in Marawi, where I come from, is something we should all combat. Now, I'd like to uh, can you please give us updates on what the Philippines is doing? Uh, do you have any um, strategies or defense and security engagements or other action countries? Thank you. Uh, I hope I got your question uh, correctly. That uh, do we have what are our uh, engagements, yeah, engagements with, with our uh, engagement, other with action our countries? countries? 
in terms of um, defense and security, meaning military engagements, and I may not be competent to answer that because that I would have to pass that through to to the uh, I wouldn't uh, attempt to be competent to respond to that now. But from what I understand, in terms of assistance from our ASEAN neighbors, we've been getting lots of a uh, great deal of assistance in response to the, the Marawi situation. Uh, in fact, last July 21, there was an, um, an aid uh, relief, uh, a relief sortie that arrived uh, from the AHA Center, the ASEAN Humanitarian Assistance Center, and we requested for that. The AHA Center provided uh, 600 family tents, 600 family kits, 600 kitchen sets, at least 3,000 personal hygiene kits, and um, several four water purification uh, units. This was the first time that the AHA Center responded to a human-induced uh, disaster. And so it exemplified the one ASEAN, one response uh, rally cry. Of, of, uh, of uh, the ASEAN and of AHA Center. And after that, uh, the, the, the government of Singapore, the Republic of Singapore, also provided uh, similar assistance. No? And so in terms of our engagements with our, uh, with our neighbors here in the ASEAN, it's, it's, it's very robust in terms of humanitarian assistance. Um, I cannot speak of the military side. No? But in terms of humanitarian assistance, rest assured that Almost daily, we are getting queries as to how our neighbors in the ASEAN and beyond uh, they're asking how they can assist. And even just now, just as we're speaking, I got a query again as, as to how we could facilitate another um, uh, intention of assistance from our ASEAN, one more ASEAN neighbors. Thank you. <laughs> Puling tawan, puling diri. Okay, how can I introduce? <laughs> I am Mr. Lim, a student of the University of Life. And uh, I would like to suggest that uh, we give the scouting movement a new list in life. Because in my younger days, pag may disaster, as a boy scout, talagang lumulusong kami. I think it's about time that the movement should be resonated and uh, to give some food for thought ang mga mas maya, mas ma, baba, mas bata ngayon, mga anak natin sila nagtanong sa akin eh Daddy, bakit yung Typhoon Pablo si Bopa nawala yung mata? Because they saw it in the, ano, yung internet. Wala talagang mata. Because the eye of the storm was actually a tornado. Which uprooted everything in its path. Actually, kung si Yolanda walang mata rin yun, ay mas, 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 mas patindi ang damage sa atin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, does that have questions? But any response? This is not about disaster. It's about the youth movement in uh, biodiversity. Uh, our center, uh, through the EU assistance, we're coming up with a youth involvement in ASEAN biodiversity. Uh, we're starting this October, and uh, this will involve all the 10 countries. Biodiversity, but I don't, I don't know if we can also touch uh, disaster. But uh, I perfectly agree with you. Scouting is one of the best ways of, uh, and also involving the youth. Okay. I think uh, we have a very productive and uh, rich and very engaging discussion. Maybe just to uh, review some of the major points that were raised. Uh, first, I think that uh, we all agree that we, 
there is a very rapid changing landscape. So things are changing very fast. Uh, not only the natural uh, you know, disasters and all of that, but even human-induced uh, disasters we are having that today. And I think to respond to these challenges, we need to have new ways of thinking, new perspectives, and I think the government has that as well, with a new framework uh, in the RRM. And I think what's, uh, what they're also presenting is that it should be a people approach. Everybody should be concerned, not only the government, but everybody's contribution is very much welcome. And I think that has been, a, in a way, demonstrated by the invitation to the academe, that if you have studies, then please uh, you know, kind of circulate and submit to our government agencies that they can incorporate those in their plans. I think that's, that's very important because those are really affected by all these calamities, these disasters are really the poor, the marginalized, and the vulnerable. And I think that can go a long way if we work together. Uh, and I think there is also a suggestion that uh, in addressing these new challenges, we need science, technology, the young people to really participate. Uh, it is an important uh, suggestion that we need to take into consideration as we move forward with these challenges that are very new to many of us. So with that, let me end this session and let us give a round of applause to our speakers. Thank you very much. And I think there is a photo session. Thank you.